Well, what a fantastic week. I want to thank all of you personally for coming here this week, making the trek during the COVID era, and uh, we really appreciate you spending some time with us. You know, a lot of people say in this day and age, well, build your own platforms, build your own institutions. And, and I think in a sense, that's exactly what we've done here at the Mises Institute. We've created a, an educational organization that has uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of videos and articles and books uh, all available online, free, around the world instantaneously in many different languages. And I think that's what building your own institutions is really all about. You know, there's a, uh, sometimes reminded, there's a, a great scene, any Sopranos fans in the audience, but there's a great scene where some hapless victim is standing there in front of Tony and, and Silvio and Polly Walnuts, and he says something like, ah, oh, the Romans, you know, where are they now? And Tony says, you're looking at him, asshole. And sometimes that's how I feel about the Austrians, you know, here we are. So our topic today is really the topic du jour in America, it's the mob. And uh, I don't think we're going to ever look back on 2020 without thinking about it, talking about the mob. And so I think we all understand, at least in this room, that mobs represent a sort of halfway house of sorts between politics, on the one hand, an outright civil war, on the other. So they're kind of this midway point between you know, politely telling your neighbor what to do via the ballot box and actually going over and burning your neighbor's house down. So this is the choice, of course, that's always facing America, uh, namely mobs or markets, and it's a choice that always and everywhere exists, two ways of organizing society which are inherently in tension, but which have been brought into very stark focus by the events of 2020. So I think understanding the reality of that choice uh, helps us to sort of reframe our program of political and economic and personal liberty into something that's maybe more coherent and especially more urgent. I think we've come to the point where it's time to abandon some of the stilted language and thinking of the old tacit social arrangement in this country because that arrangement no longer exists. So 2020, uh, it's definitely the year of peak mob. And it's easy enough to ascribe all of this tension. Well, we had the George Floyd killing and riots that came after that, protests that came after that. We've had the stress and tension of COVID-19, which has got a lot of people uh, stuck at home and sort of angry. But we all know that all of this strife was sort of baked into the cake, so to speak. I mean, America had very serious financial problems, very serious social and cultural, and especially political problems. By that, I mean the politicization of America prior to 2020. But nonetheless, if we look at the scoreboard a little bit about 2020 to date, and we still got five months to go, people. Um, you know, we have Minneapolis where, from what I read, $500 million worth of damage to over 500 buildings. Matter of fact, we have a friend of the Institute who owns a convenience store in Minneapolis. He called me yesterday and we talked about how he had had some armed guys on his roof for about 10 days of his convenience store. So when our friends in the say, well, they have insurance. Okay, they have insurance. Uh, Portland, Portlandia, has had 50 straight days of rioting and unrest at night. Still going on, the federal courthouse and now a police station are both surrounded. So I guess if you have a date in federal court in Portland district, uh, you are currently on hold. Seattle had the CHAZ, the autonomous zone, which was occupied for several weeks. Uh, I went and dug up a story about the Capitol Hill neighborhood in Seattle, uh, which had been a little bit of a rough part of town adjacent to downtown, and it had been gentrified over the 1990s, especially by the gay community, and uh, had more recently been sort of discovered as a slightly more affordable part of Seattle the last 10 years. And then a, a lot of new people came in, and the article in question in the Seattle newspaper had a sign up in front of a gay bar that said, um, that was protesting sort of the gentrification of the gentrifiers, the earlier gentrifiers. And the sign said, uh, we moved here to get away from you. And I thought, man, if that were, if somebody had that kind of sign up in, in a lot of other different contexts, that would not be acceptable. And it was actually featured in, the, in this story. And of course, we've had unrest in Washington, D.C., in Chicago, still ongoing. The Christopher Columbus statue is being surrounded. Uh, we have had unrest in Richmond, Virginia, uh, certainly in Los Angeles, 
Uh, there was a, a two-day riot, and you, you want to talk about bad. This riot came within about a block of David Gordon's uh, longtime deli restaurant, Cantor's Deli. So, I mean, th th we're talking about civilization here, people. <laughs> this is where David Gordon gets his uh, ham and pastrami every afternoon. And, and, and I jest, but seriously, Cantor's Deli is a landmark in Los Angeles, been there for decades, and the people who own it, uh, D D David is like family to them, and vice versa. So uh, there's no joking matter to him. And of course, uh, not just riots per se, but also statues have come down all across America, not just Lee and Stonewall Jackson and Jefferson Davis and Rothbard's favorite John C. Calhoun in South Carolina, but also, of course, Washington and Jefferson and Grant, perhaps, and Teddy Roosevelt, maybe, uh, Christopher Columbus. Maybe some of you saw Nancy Pelosi said the other day when asked about this in her former hometown of Baltimore, where her dad was a nasty cronyist mayor, she said, people will do what they do, which sounds a lot like people did some things. Um, and of course, uh, even Father Junipero Serra, uh, who is a great Spanish missionary who built or helped build and start 21 Spanish missions across this home, the state of California, has been toppled in San Francisco. And that hits a little closer to home because those missions are still active, uh, working cemeteries for a lot of people. Uh, my own wife has her father's remains at, at one of those Spanish mission, missions just north of San Diego. I wonder whether it's maybe time to take your loved one's remains out of those missions. I wonder how long those will, will last without being defaced or worse. And of course, we have the McCloskeys in St. Louis who uh, had their home, the famous Anheuser-Busch mansion, attacked by a mob and uh, showed some very poor uh, firearm skills when they came out, and also uh, were not exactly dressed for the occasion. But, you know, uh, I give them a lot of credit. They stood in front of their house, and they, they stared down the mob. And that's not nothing. But in addition to all these events that we've read about, there are a thousand little micro-events by mini-mobs every day across America, and because everyone has one of these damnable cell phones, uh, they're all being recorded in grocery stores, etc., uh, gas stations, mini-marts all across America. And I know in our own state of Alabama, but I suspect across the country, that the fact that uh, some of the, the pro-mask people are now being emboldened by mandates, by sort of what I would call the color of law, that we're going to have a lot more of these incidents with uh, the maskers you know, yelling at people and having altercations. So when we look at all these sort of physical, tangible uh, examples of the mob in 2020, the, the obvious uh, historical example we like to look back on is 1968. And, you know, is this as bad as 1968? None of you were alive, of course. Um, and, and how can we compare the two eras? So I did a little digging online, and I noticed the first thing that happens in sites like CNN and The Atlantic, et cetera, is that, oh, no, 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 2020 is nowhere near as bad as 1968, which leads me to believe it's as bad as 1968, <laughs> or worse. But it's, it's awfully hard to compare because you don't really have rest counts or body counts, all that sort of stuff is hard to get. And, and comparing the dollar amounts of damages is just nominal, and that doesn't really work too well. But again, we have five months to go in 2020. And uh, you know, we think back especially to what happened in Minneapolis uh, and comparing that to Detroit. Uh, you had sort of the overhang in 1968 of the, of the Vietnam War which have really affected people's consciousness. I, I, I hate to say more than our ongoing wars in the Middle East affect ours. Uh, you also had the fairly recent assassinations. It's still in people's memories of both RFK and Martin Luther King Jr. So, uh, you know, there was certainly some uh, unrest at that time that would rival perhaps the unrest we have today of the Trump versus anti-Trump and COVID and, and all these kinds of things. But as an aside, you know, uh, that great champion of civil liberties uh, with six houses or whatever, Mitt Romney, who, of course, recently made a grandstanding pose of marching with Black Lives Matter. Uh, the governor of Michigan, who actually called out the National Guard to violently quell those 1968 protests, was none other than George Romney. So perhaps he thinks he is atoning for the sins of his father. But one thing America did not have in 1968 was the idea of a digital or online mob, and that we've got in spades today. So that really uh, creates what we call cancel culture. 
but don't think that cancel culture or online mobs don't have physical manifestations in the sense that they affect people's real lives in the virtual, excuse me, in the tangible, physical, corporeal sphere. They do. Let me throw out some examples of digital mob victims. Some of you obviously know Gab, which was created to try to be a, an online platform uh, to compete with Twitter. That uh, was founded by a gentleman named Andrew Torba. Well, he was recently not only deplatformed, but he was debanked. Uh, and so not only Mr. Torba, but everyone in his family, everyone at his address, uh, where he lives, which I don't know if he has children or not, uh, is no longer able to use the services of commercial banks. Uh, a little closer to home, some of, some of the uh, professors in our circles know uh, Professor Harold Uleg at the University of Chicago, who was at one time the department chair, and he is uh, currently barely editor of the Journal of Political Economy, which is a prestigious journal in economic circles, and he said something a few years ago that was somewhat dismissive, I guess, allegedly, in a class about Martin Luther King, and a student wrote this down, and this was 2015 or something, but then this, this somehow came to light in 2020, and, and they tried to cancel him from this position. Uh, of course, we have James Bennett, the editor of the New York Times, who was recently forced basically by the mob to step down after, I guess, he green-lighted an, edit an editorial by that horrible Senator Tom Cotton, I think, that was basically, you know, unleash the hounds or something like that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's an editorial decision. And uh, we recently, just a couple days ago, saw this letter in Harper's uh, about some sort of more old-fashioned left-wingers bemoaning cancel culture and starting to be a little worried that maybe the guillotine is, is uh, being uh, set up a little closer to their house. And uh, I think it was two days ago we had this grandstanding announcement by Barry Weiss, who against all odds, uh, despite being, from what I can see, someone of no account or intelligence or ability whatsoever, <laughs> a complete cipher, uh, landed a job at the uh, New York Times and de declared her departure because this cancer culture is just too, too much. Uh, you might want to stay tuned to her Twitter feed because I suspect she's going to have a soft landing and already had something planned for her own uh, personal finances that tends to run that way in those circles. Uh, but there have been others, uh, and not always on the right, oftentimes on the left. I mentioned Barry Weiss, but uh, the author J.K. Rowling of the Harry Potter series, and also the great tennis player Martina Navratilova, Navratilova excuse me, uh, are both strong left feminists have come out against uh, transgenderism in its sense, uh, in this, in the, uh, with the idea that you know men, transgender men. Uh, positioning themselves as women, as I should say biological men positioning themselves as transgender women have started to invade some of the female spaces and that this is actually an encouraging its feminism. Uh, so both of them have gotten some heat from that. And when you think about cancel culture, you say, well, you know, J.K. Rowling's really rich. She has a giant mansion. She has all, these, all this money in the bank, so she's going to be fine. And that might be true, but, you know, what, what if the mob literally comes to her neighborhood like it did with the McCloskeys in Chicago, excuse me, in St. Louis? What if it just surrounds her street? Uh, this has happened in places like Bel Air and Beverly Hills recently. Well, all of her neighbors are going to you know, not want this commotion, and she might be stuck in her house, not able to leave in a car. So the idea that money insulates you, and, and if we're going to have uh, all kinds of penalties in people's lives for uh, offending the woke gods, then why wouldn't that also extend to a civil penalty? Why shouldn't you, the UK pass some law that J.K. Rowling is actually uh, owes a civil penalty? Why shouldn't they actually be able to go after her money and her mansion? It seems like about a quarter step away from where we are. I'm not so sure that's far-fetched. Uh, but I, 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 before we move, I just want to mention that sometimes you have to have a little shade and Freud, a little, a little uh, excitement when some people are canceled. I'm, I'm against cancel culture, but. There's nothing wrong with feeling a little twinge of happiness from time to time. <laughs> and this is surely something we can all feel when certain celebrities get the boot, uh, including some who have done blackface. Uh, Jimmy Fallon, apparently, I, you know, did a skit years ago where he pretended to be uh, the, the comic. Uh, Sarah Silverman apparently has done blackface. Um, you know, so th these kinds of things tend to come back to bite the people who uh, 
uh, put them in motion. And most recently, uh, a black celebrity and podcaster named Nick Cannon has got found himself in trouble and potentially being canceled by the mob. And I don't know who he is until this week, so I can't opine much more on that. But it's just interesting to see this stuff happening to people who perhaps thought that they were not only immune, but in the vanguard of this revolution. So for our purposes, talking about the mob, we cannot imagine that it's not going to come for economics. Of course, it's going to come for economics. Uh, if you're familiar with FinTwit, financial Twitter, there are some voices on the left who uh, occupy that space very noisily. People like Noah Smith, who goes by Noah Opinion, a writer at, at Bloomberg. Marshall Steinbaum, uh, sort of a hack economist at University of Utah. Stephanie Kelton, who is now famous for, the, uh, for being the, sort of the latest proponent of MMT, which you heard about earlier this week. She also has a new book called The Deficit Myth. Uh, I think these people are really sort of replacing the old guard left in economics, the Brad DeLongs and the Greg Mancuse and, and perhaps even the Paul Krugmans. Uh, Forbes recently had an article in Forbes, right? We think of Forbes as sort of a pro-market publication, not so much. Uh, it had an article about, check out these five new economists, new, 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 remaking the science, you know, as though there's not an edifice or a body to economics, it just needs to be remade. And they were all, they were all females, and so the article really hyped that up, and, and it just hyped up their femaleness. None of them were really free market or, or, or ha, you know, capitalists. They were, it was just, uh, one of them was a big green, one of them was Esther Duflo, who recently won a, or co-won a, a Nobel for behavioral economics, which is nonsense. One of them was Kelton. <laughs> Uh, you know, so it was, just, it was just all about their femaleness, not about their, the, the fact uh, that the uh, economics which they profess or practice is, from, from where I sit, egregiously wrong and misguided. But when Forbes uses the term remaking economics, I think that tells you a lot about what you need to know, because a lot of people on the left especially, but on the right somewhat, they, they think economics isn't a real science. It's just sort of a bunch of intellectual cover for business interests and that you can kind of make it up as you go and that economies can be commanded by legislatures with things like minimum wage, for example, or tariffs or whatever it might be. And so economics isn't a real science. You get a lot of that sense uh, from Fintwit uh, that we're, we need new economics. And so let's not forget, uh, the mob has gone after the English literary canon and in some part because it mostly consists of a bunch of dead white males. Uh, Shakespeare, etc. So if we look back at the body of knowledge we have in economics, the edifice, you know, whether you're talking about Adam Smith or Marx or Keynes or Marshall or Samuelson or Stiglitz, not to mention the Austrians like Mises and Hayek, uh, that's a bunch of dead white guys. And there is this sense, almost a polylogism uh, uh, afoot. Mises talked about, well, there's different logics for different groups of people, depending on their, their political persuasion and all that. I think we're starting to see that, that there's different economics for different people. And I, I would argue that if Jefferson and Washington can fall to the mob, uh, we, we certainly shouldn't think that uh, Keynes and Paul Krugman can't. They can. Uh, the mob has also come for political... Libertarianism, no question about it. I've mentioned this to, in the past, but I'm a huge fan of a very brief essay that George Orwell penned for a magazine in 1946 called uh, Politics in the English Language. Look it up, it's online, readable, great little quick article. And one of the sections he has, and that's called Meaningless Words. And meaningless words are words that are used by the political or media or influential class in, in what he terms consciously dishonest ways obviously to uh, try to persuade you to their way of thinking. And I fear that the term libertarian or libertarianism is now one of Orwell's meaningless words, just like liberal and liberalism has unfortunately become by usage. Uh, I'm, I'm a stickler for the English language, but I also understand that meanings change by usage. That's a fact. I've always thought libertarian works better as an adjective not as a noun, you know, I, someone who favors a libertarian drug policy or a libertarian criminal policy or something where, where the goal is less state or no state involvement in that sphere of life. But uh, libertarian as a noun comes, sort of pushes us into this realm where we're talking about being libertarian, 
You know, not, not so much in the sense of purity tests, but though there's a particular sort of type of person or a particular worldview or a particular outlook that makes one a libertarian as opposed to a, a sort of a, a narrower political and legal theory. So uh, I, I think that's, that's uh, it's interesting how what, a word that really started out as an adjective morphed into a noun. And of course, today we have the term libertarian or libertarianism uh, being something that really accepts the language and the framing and the issues and the context, even the goals of progressives, starting with, of course, egalitarianism. But also this idea that uh, we need to have an obsession with race and racism, with sex and sexuality as political issues, and that there's this, this phony dichotomy somehow between social issues and, and economics. That's, that's, of course, not true. And I fear that, as with most movements, you could say this even about the Austrian school, I would say in a positive way there, but in a negative way here, is that the sociology of a movement sort of becomes the movement. In other words, the sociology becomes the ideology, the kind of person becomes the person. And so when we allow ourselves to politicize what ought not be political, I think this sort of inexorably moves libertarians towards a direction, really, of, a, of an outright uh, positive rights worldview. And I think that's a very dangerous thing. So what we think of as libertarianism today is kind of this muddy mixture of liberation theology. I don't like all these constraints on my person and my uh, self-actualization, which is, you know, self-actualization is a fine thing. And we should all work on ourselves, but it's not a political thing. It's not something that you need to have as part of your politics. And when you, when you sort of smuggle it in, I think you do injury to that, uh, to that concept. If we look at a lot of the great libertarian thinkers of the 20th century, uh, you could say Albert J. Nock, even Ayn Rand, the Tannehills, Robert Nozick, Sam Konkin, and of course Rothbard and Hoppe, from our perspective, a lot of what we think of as libertarian political theory, I think, has really been done. Uh, the, the, you know, the idea of anarcho-capitalism and how far you can take things with respect to courts and law and police, I think, has, has really been done. So what's far more interesting today than libertarian theory is the applications of what a stateless society might look like, whether that's, you know, whether someone thinks Bitcoin is that argument or, or Uber comes along and just disposes of the, of the taxi monopoly sort of by stealth, working in the gray market. However, you know, I, I find those applications more interesting than the theory at this point. And so because the mob has sort of uh, come, even for, you know, this minority political perspective of Libertarianism, I think it, it now as a political program remains pretty hopeless. And I think uh, if there's any hope for it, it's at the smaller, uh, more localized level. So if the mob has come for us, uh, both literally in the physical sense of statues and the like, but also in the digital online space, uh, what, what's our goal with respect, to, what's our job with respect to promoting what we would consider sensible economics or sensible liberty, sensible political views? Well, I think th there's perhaps an argument for reframing uh, the way we look at the world. I, Rachel put this together for me quickly, but you know, we have a whole a range of things that, uh, a hierarchy of what compels us to certain actions and what persuades us with respect to certain actions. And I'm a, a lot more, I'm a lot happier with persuading people than compelling them. So if we look at this hierarchy, you think there's all kinds of things that might persuade you, starting with your own self and your own agency and your conscience, you know, your parents, the society around you, uh, social pressure, maybe even things which you voluntarily uh, decide to do, like enter into an HOA or uh, work under certain workplace rules at your job. So. Uh, you know, these are all examples of we can do things without force and compulsion. But on the upper tier, we have sort of a hierarchy of things that uh, uh, comprise force and compulsion, which, uh, which are sort of on the rise. At the very worst end, we have wars, outright wars. We have concentration camps. We have sort of a police state and mobs and politics, engaging in politics, and we're sort of there. So unfortunately, I think we're climbing that hierarchy rather than coming down it. And a lot of human history has been about trying to come down that hierarchy, not climb it. 
So I think that's really what we have before us in the task of reframing economics and political liberty into something that's more about uh, uh, our opposition to the mob. And the antidote to the mob, the corrective to the mob, the countervailing force to the mob is the marketplace. Economics, if we think about it correctly, is really counter politics because entrepreneurs are the real revolutionaries, not politicians, not political activists. Entrepreneurs are the people out there doing the hard work of creating win-win trades for people while the political class is out there creating and expanding that zero-sum game which moves us uh, the wrong way up this ladder. So the entrepreneur replaces the political activist in when we sort of think of reframing things as markets versus the mob. Build it really means persuade. So Mises gave us this great conception of liberalism, and this to me is one of the greatest sentences he ever wrote. He said, the, the program of liberalism, if condensed into a single word, would have to read property. I mean, that's an incredible statement if you think about it. And property, of course, implies a lot of things. It implies capital, it implies production, it implies win-win, it, it implies trade, it implies material benefit, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we get civilization. Not through the mob, we get it through markets. You know, Murray Rothbard takes pains at the beginning of Man, Economy, and State to point out that economics as a sort of subset of praxeology concerns itself with voluntary action, choice, exchange, all of which are naturally bound up, perhaps not explicitly, perhaps not even consciously, but they're naturally bound up in our notions of political liberty. But they can be planted in people's minds without all the normative strictures necessarily of ethics. So I really like Rothbard's framing of market versus the mob, which is basically power versus market. That's what he chose to title that section of Man, Economy, and State, which is also a standalone book. It's the fundamental way we present, I think, to the outside world the two choices that are in front of us. And of course, this echoes Franz Oppenheimer's dictum that we have sort of two basic choices, the economic means or the political means. So to me, this is a very satisfying way to frame things because we can talk to people without politics. No politics, that's what I want is a world without them. And really, entrepreneurs are out there doing that. They're living without politics. They're living outside of politics. And that doesn't mean politics doesn't affect them. Of course, criminality affects every entrepreneur. There's public criminality and private criminality. Why do you lock the door of your store at night? Well, OK, so entrepreneurs work around the state the same way they work around people who might want to come break into their store at night. But I got to tell you, in closing here, 2020 is starting to feel pretty late in the game. You know, I think the, the mobs are moving us towards com full compulsion. So I think we have to oppose not only the mob, but mobs per se, on the principle that the mob is the enemy of markets and civilization. Because ultimately, as we have seen, and as some of our friends on the left have seen just in the past few months, ultimately the mob is going to come for all of us. So our fight today is really not so much libertarianism versus statism or agorism or voluntarism or all of these different words we think of. It's really about markets versus mobs. It's about reasonable, reasonable people versus unreasonable people. It's about civilization versus de-civilization. And that's what we have, unfortunately, happening here in the United States of America. So I'm going to close with some ancient wisdom regarding mobs. This isn't new. This is ancient wisdom from all the way back in 1981, from that ancient philosopher king, Ronnie James Dio of Black Sabbath, who wrote in 1981 for the movie Heavy Metal, the great song The Mob Rules. And Ronnie James Dio says, close the city and tell the people that something's coming to call. Death and darkness are rushing forward. Sounds like COVID. If you listen to fools, the mob rules. And of course, that's why all of you are here this week. Thank you so much. Sure.